But in the, uh, I promised you uh, a certain sermon, I'm going to give that one. Now we had a couple people in the audience that recognized the typo in the promotion for this week. I mean, if you saw it. Did you, Tiffany? I mentioned it too. You did, okay. Yeah, usually, I'm used to that part of it. But I went ahead and fixed it, is that better? I misspelled trouble last week. And uh, so as I talked to you last week, or mentioned last week, I want to talk to you about God's cure for heart trouble. I wouldn't normally show you the graphic for a message uh, beforehand, but however, just to let you know, I fixed the, fixed the typo. I had a couple people come up afterwards and, uh, and tell me about it, so I really appreciate that. All right, let's pray for the message, shall we? Father, again, we are thankful. Uh, Lord, we're, uh, we need you this morning. We hear from you, pray you to bless our time together. And uh, help us as we go, help us to be encouraged, uh, help our, our hearts to be uh, softened. And Lord, uh, and Lord, help us walk out here better Christians than we walked in. We love you, so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we live in kind of troublesome times. Now, if Christians of the past would look at our time, they'd probably think, no, you're really kind of not. But however, we don't think all around the world there are people facing persecution. But even then, you don't have to, just because other Christians had it worse than us, doesn't mean that we can live in a time where our hearts are troubled. We're facing a lot of different things. A lot of us have, you know, inflation touches all of us. Uh, the, the, the struggles of life touch all of us, just sometimes in different ways. We have Middle East violence going on. But let me remind you, as I did two weeks ago, there's been 3,000 years of Middle East violence. And, uh, you know, I, you know, you have people a couple weeks ago, you know, throwing around, hey, we're after the end of the world stuff. Yeah, you know, there'll, there'll be another time here in a couple, another couple months where there's going to be another flare up. And uh, it, it, rapture could happen. Don't, don't, you know, but, uh, you know, we're not looking over to, you know, wars of the Middle East to decide if that's, Going to be the case, but you know, God talks about heart trouble, and so this morning, you know, do you feel it? And maybe it's not about money. Maybe it's about you know just really a dis disconnect. A, a, you know, something like we talk about so many times. There's something going on in the background, right? So, you know, maybe we fa face anxiety. Maybe we face care. Maybe we face stress. Just like the old hymn. Maybe, which we, we don't have a rotation as far as I know. Uh, all your anxiety, all your care. Bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. But it's easier said than done, isn't it? We're told, hey, we're supposed to cast all our care upon him. That should take care of everything, but as soon as we put it on there, you know, half the time I go, I go pick it up and take it back, don't you? You know, something happens again. I, it, you know, I get this thing figured out for a moment, and then all of a sudden it happens again. And so what am I supposed to do? Now, I want to give you a one-time disclaimer. I'm not going to repeat this 50 times throughout the, throughout the sermon, but I will say this. I'm not talking about you're not taking your heart medication. I'm not talking you know, about if there's you know, some medical condition that needs something beyond what we're talking about, heart trouble. I'm not talking about that. Not talking about you not going talking to a therapist or anything of that nature. But what I am covering today is that kind of things that, that don't take. You know, for, you know, if I, you know, like when I chopped my thumb in half, you know, a couple months ago, it's amazing how the body knows how to heal itself. Isn't it great that evolution gave us a way for us to split our thumbnail right in half and it grows back? I wonder how the evolution taught to do that. But, you know, I needed medical help, right? And so, not talking about that today, uh, but talking about uh, the other things going on. But John chapter 14, if you want to open your Bible there, or I'll have them all up here for you uh, today. Jesus said this, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. If you ever had a pity party and somebody was kind of pushing your place, 
I have those on occasion, and Lisa's that person in my life on occasion. She lets me have my penny parties, right? She lets me kind of, you know, whatever. You know, I think we should give each other the kind of grace that they need to, to just kind of, you know, have a little bit of, you know, of a penny party and come back. But it's interesting here in this context. Jesus is about to face the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the night that he's about to face Ananias and Caiaphas. He's about to go without sleep. The next day, he will be facing Pilate and Herod, then Pilate again. The next day, from this, this is being sp spoken at night, the next day, he's going to be f facing a beating, a crucifixion, and separation from God. But you, ask, you might ask yourself a question. The division chapters are there, and uh, I'm not going to get into the debate whether they should be or not, but however, the division chapters are there. Sometimes we forget to look to, to the previous thing. So what had just happened? In the previous chapter, back at look at verses uh, 13 through 32, Jesus talks about his betrayal. Imagine that. Is there much worse than betrayal? Then he picks it up here in verse 33. It says here, ye little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, uh, I'm sorry, so now I say to you, a new commandment that I give you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And then Simon Peter said, No, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered, Whether I go, thou cannot follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. And so you see here, there's Jesus is about to face in the next 24 hours the the just the weight of the world, the, the, the sin, everything imaginable. And so Peter says, Hey, why can't we come with you? Now watch this. Peter said, Then Lord, why uh, can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered them, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say to thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So it's interesting. In context then, Jesus' comments in chapter 14 make a lot more sense. Jesus, hey, listen, you're going to deny me three times. And yet in the next chapter, the next very phrase he says, he looks back at him and says, let me out your heart be troubled. Is that something we as Christians can pull off? Not very well. But notice Jesus' first words out of his mouth after saying, you will deny me. Let not your heart be troubled. See, they're facing the loss of their leader. You know, we think about, you know, our government. And uh, Israel is being run by the Romans. Pilate and Herod were not Jews. They were appointed by Caesar. They had tax collection for a different country. They were facing abuse. They were facing humiliation. Imagine another country invading us, taking over, and all of a sudden we... Imagine paying a tax to Russia in rubles. None of us would take kindly to that. Imagine, you know, pick a country that you want to pick, but... You know, if we go throughout the history here, there was the Philistines, there was the exile, there's the Greek Empire, there's the fight for independence, the Maccabees, all that other sort of stuff going on. Uh, there's the theocracy, but no open vision for about 400 years. And now, under Roman rule. And here they are crucifying their citizens. There's abuse. Not only, not only has another country come in and been abusive and taxing, but now we have the Jewish religious leaders cramping down on their clamping down, sorry, cramping down, clamping down on their religious freedom. And we're worried. And by the way, I'm not dismissing anything, saying techno, I'm just, I'm just talking about it. You know, we're facing right now a devaluation of the dollar. <laughs> but then imagine being forced to use rules or some other currency. Political uncertainty. Pilate was on the verge of losing his job. Caesar wanted to fire him, and that was actually part of the reason that he listened to the crowd and pushed crucifixion. But it's funny to me that Jesus and the disciples were able to turn the world upside down in the midst of an oppressive government. So we face worry. 
We face concern, but the question becomes, are we saved? You know, some people can be pretty negative. And you, you know, you've ever asked the question, hey, how are you doing today? And you're, well, then here we go. The question is, does nothing good ever happen? And of course it has. But I want to give you God's cure today. And with the shortness of the sermon, you know, not the shortness of the whole service, we already started a little early, you know, had to hit the express lane for a moment. But I think also today we'll be out of here a couple minutes early. Not that you're looking for that. See, what is God's cure? I'm going to give you five points, if you don't mind. And they're right here in the text. Uh, God has a cure for, for heart trouble. And he has it right here. Jesus tells us exactly what it is. Number one, cure, no, the number one step in here is believe in God. So he said there, let, your, not your heart, not, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Now, here's the thing. This here is a statement of fact. Ye believe in God. Jesus is pointing out. You have a belief. You know, everybody has a God. Every religion, including atheism, has its God. Whether that God is, you know, the so-called science, so-called logic, and uh, we can argue those points all day, but that's not the purpose of our being here. And so, but, you know, everybody has their God. It doesn't matter what religion it is. There's always a God. It's written into our very DNA. We know that there's a God. You know, we may not, you know, they hide it in different ways. You know, sending thoughts as if there's some sort of, you know, portal sending thoughts, sending vibes, uh, spiritual, not religious. No matter what, I'm not making fun at all. I'm just making a point. I had a conversation one time with somebody, and now this kind of is something that catches on, and I think more people know, is somebody said, well, there are no absolutes. Are you absolutely sure about that? Will you let me preach a sermon like <laughs> And that's just it. Are you absolutely sure that there are no absolutes? You know, then it takes you back to Star Wars 3, only it says still in absolutes, but yet that's an absolute statement, right? So right there in the cinematic history, you know, a big, you know, a big... See, those science fiction movies, you just got to be careful. Because they'll say something like, hey, there are, it only says still absolutes, it says absolutely. But then in the meeting of Star Trek, and they split an infinitive, the most famously split infinitive in all the world. It's even an infinitive. Too boldly go is not proper English. Just so you know. Boldly to go. But it just doesn't have the same ring to it. So anyway, back to this. Believe in God. See, we're talking to saved people here. Do you ever look at artist's depiction of our universe? Do you ever stop and think first that we can't get a good picture of Pluto from this distance? We have to have somebody fly by in order to get a decent photo. But yet we have pictures of planets around other stars. Stop and think about that for a minute. Remember, it's always artist depictions. Not saying they're not, not there. I'm just saying, you know, well, this one has a core of this, but you know, but yet we can't figure out what, what Pluto has half the time. But anyways, but we look at the grandeur of the universe. We look at the sheer size of it, completely unfathomable just to get to the next star. And then there's another star after that. And then there's a galaxy, and then there's another galaxy, and then there's galaxy clusters. But a God that can create all of that is showing me that he has time for me. You know, what, what would make people happy if it was just the Milky Way out there and there's nothing beyond that? Would that make people happy? But we see all of this, and what we need to realize, God is not bound by our three dimensions. He's outside of it. We look at creation and then all of a sudden we can understand how God could know the thoughts and intents of seven billion people at the same time. Why well, is not bound by time? It's pretty easy stuff. We read Psalm 19. God's first ordained preacher is the heavens. We look at the heavens and it declares his glory, declares his handiwork. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says that they are without excuse. Anybody who can look outside, look down at the grass, look up at the stars, for they are without excuse. We look at the grandeur, but then we look down and we see the cellular level, the detail, the harmony, the balance. Our planet is unique because God put us here. Remember, this was all created. You look at the, the artist's depictions of the universe. Remember, we look at all that. Well, then why would God put us right here in this corner of the universe over here? Well, remember, we we're created for, all of it was created for his pleasure, not for ours. We are not the center of the universe. He is. 
at the same time while he's not bound to it. It's no problem. Number one, believe in God. That's Jesus said, you believe in God. Ye believe in God. Number two, very first, believe in Christ. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, which is a statement of fact. You believe in God. We know this. Jesus said, believe also in me. So first it was a statement of truth. Now we have a command. Believe also in me. No one can believe in the true God unless he believes in Jesus, the true Son of God. Look at John 14, 6. This is just a little bit further down in the, in the, in the text. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus is exclusive. Jesus, when he made this statement, and there's people out there that don't like this statement. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, there's different ways. Well, then if there was, there's no point in Jesus being crucified. So what we need to do today is we need to quit doubting our salvation. You believe in God, believe also in me. We could go through all scripture and talk about the assurance of salvation. And but what we do is we get through our life, we do something stupid, right? I even said that last week. I said, hey, listen, you know, for the people that raise their hands for salvation, you're gonna goof up on the way home. How many of you, you goofed up on the way home? I did. Because <laughs> inevitably somebody pulls out in front of me. And you know, I just want people to drive with the same intensity that they pulled out in front of me with, right? That's all I ask. Pull out in front of me, but I don't have to take my brakes. Great day. Have a good time. But you know, don't pull out in front of me and not even drive the speed limit. Do you think there's something I need to work on there? <laughs> Look, is the Bible true? And if it is, there are so many implications to that. If the Bible's true, we can believe it. If the Bible's true, we can trust it. If the Bible's true, then you know it, 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 it's right here. But how do we know that Jesus is true? How do we look at so well, how do you know about this whole Christianity thing? How can you dare agree with Jesus on John 14, 6? I'm going to do the life, no matter what follow by me. What if there was another way? Well, let me, let me just think this whole thing out. Let's just break it down in, in very simple terms. The fact that no credible atheists believe that there was no Jesus ever. Even some of the stronger ones saying, you guys are making the wrong argument saying that there was no Jesus. We know that there was a Jesus. What they doubt is his claims, his miracles, his crucifixion, and his, rape, his uh, being raised from the dead. But nobody, doubt, nobody doubts the existence of this Jesus Christ. Or I should say, a Jesus Christ. And if it was just Jesus, and he came, he spoke, he died, he rose again, and that was it? Yeah, you might have reason for doubt. You might have reason to stop and say, hmm. But what he did is he had 12 disciples around him. <coughs> Jesus didn't pin one word of this. But however, the people that knew him did. And the people that knew him and left, there are people around this planet that die for a cause every day. Matter of fact, there are people who die for other religions. But there's nobody who knowingly dies for something they know to be a lie. So the disciples go out. One is crucified. One is uh, exiled to Patmos. One is dragged through the streets. Another is boiled in oil. As a matter of fact, I think a few of them were crucified. Uh, you know, fed to lions. Starved. Everything that they faced. The Hebrews talks about that. Sawn asunder. But why would they do that if they knew that they were perpetrating a lie? And you wouldn't. You're facing being sawn, cut in half. You know, you're going to say, you know what? Yeah, this whole thing has been a lie. Not one of them did. And they wrote about it. And they told us about it. And so therefore, you know, well, people die for Islam all the time. Well, but if they were the ones right around Muhammad at the beginning and then died knowing that they lied, then yeah, you might have a point. That's not what happens. See, the disciples died. You wouldn't die for what you know to be a lie. Believe. You believe in God. You believe in Jesus. And by the way, believing in Jesus makes everything simple. Just believe what he said. Number three. <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. So number three, we're going to talk about this. Believe in heaven. Let not, not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. You ever stop and wonder what that means? 
If it were not so, I would have told you. I'd go to prepare a place for that phrase, by the way. If it were not so. Jesus says, well, you know, in this case, I'm not lying to you like you ever did. I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. As a matter of fact, if you look at that, so he's been preparing a place for us for 2,000 years. Do you wonder how glorious heaven is going to be? Been preparing for 2,000 years. Yeah. And that mansion's there. And my father says, why does that house have mansions inside of it? Does that mansions, is that talking, there's people who believe that it's talking about our bodies. But why would I need a place to be when there's no night? I don't need to go place find a place to sleep. I don't need to, you know, I, I and, and, and for, there's a couple of phrases in the Bible that are so common, but yet so deep. What's that talking about? It's like, let's go ahead and argue about Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let there be light. Let's go ahead and just talk about that most simple thing and try to figure out what exactly he's talking about. <laughs> you can't. <clears throat> are our bodies themselves mansions? Are we going to live in God's house with a, that, that has a room? Does that mean that you know, I'm going to be on, uh, my, I'm on floor 7 and uh, my room is 7,329,483,000 B. Right? I don't know. I don't know how that works. But who cares? On the last page of my Bibles, on, on at least two of them, I'm, this is my new one, so I'm not sure if I put it there. I have this written at the bottom. Heaven is not where we spend eternity, but with whom we spend eternity. Is it going to be in a trailer park? Fine. Jesus is there. Is it going to be on a gravel road? I live on a gravel road. I live on a gravel road with a lot of potholes. <laughs> I mean, it, you dodge these things, and it, it just comes to a point where you just give up, just floor it and go. And you know, I have a warranty on my suspension, so you know, get it to get it to break on time, right? But who cares where it is? Who cares if there's streets of gold? Who cares if there's uh, 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 pearly gates? Who cares about that other stuff? Who cares if there's a river of life? Who cares if there's a tree of life? But you know what? Jesus will be there. <clears throat> so Jesus has been preparing a place for us for 2,000 years. It must be an amazing place. Number one, we said believe in God. Number two, we said believe in Christ. Number three, we said believe in heaven. And again, you know what? What's the worst that could happen? And I said, you know, you, know, you could die. Well, there's actually worse things that probably could. But in general, there are worse things. Uh, you know, back uh, back when I used to live there, I had Tom Hurts as my coach. And, you know, sometimes you, 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 you know, mentally think, you know, overthink yourself and whatever. And, uh, but, you know, he'd look at you and say, what's the worst that could happen? You die. That's not going to happen today. So, okay. yeah, you might throw your shoulder out. You might, you know, you know, separate a hip. You might do something else, break a limb or whatever. But that's not going to happen. And, uh, <laughs> or that might happen, but you're not going to die. So, live. Get it done. But number four, what, what did Jesus tell us to believe here? Look at verse three. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Paul expected the Lord's return in his lifetime. Matter of fact, when he wrote 1 Thessalonians, if you go read that today, it's only five, five, six chapters long. It's encouraging. It talks about the Lord coming back and talking about the sequence of events of, of how it's got to happen. And uh, it's, it, it, you know, it talks about the falling away. I think we're in a falling away, but however, whatever, you know, whatever, maybe we're not. And uh, there might be, there was falling away. That falling away, by the way, that falling away is talking about apostasy, not talking about a, a, a rapture. There has to be an apostasy first. And uh, I believe in there, by the way. Um, but doesn't mean this has to be the apostasy. There could be another one in another couple hundred years. But 1 Thessalonians was written so well that the people of Thessalonica quit their jobs. People of Thessalonica decide, you know what? We're just going to go sit on this hill over there and we're going to stare up into the air and wait for Christ to come back. It's in that context where Jesus said, now be careful how you throw this out. He, if you don't work, neither shall eat, referring to people who had stopped work and stopped doing everything else, went and sat on a mountain, stared up in the sky, waiting for Jesus to return. Jesus, no, Paul's like, no, 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 no. Go be productive. Go do something. I, yeah, but yet, 1 Thessalonians written so well for them, and they were so convinced 
that by the second second Thessalonians have to be written as a correction. Well, what if and insert your least favorite political character? What if that person is the Antichrist? What if Biden? What if Trump? What if Obama? Did I hit anybody else? Do I, do I have to go beyond three to get her beyond everybody's worst least favorite? You know, whoever it is. What if that person's Antichrist? You know what? Who cares? The Antichrist is going to be defeated. <laughs> if I'm going to be honest with you, I vote for the guy because you know what? He gets it off. And we're almost out of here. I'm good with that. <laughs> you vote for the Antichrist. In the grand scheme, probably. I don't know. Uh, don't hold me to that because remember, we're not going to know he's the Antichrist until afterwards, just so you know. It's not like he's walking around with a name tag saying, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the Antichrist. Um, which, by the way, is also the first beast. And then there's the second beast, which people get that mixed up because the first beast, remember, is a political leader. The second one is a spiritual leader. And uh, the first one raises, the second one raises the first one from the dead. And so people are going to be like, their minds are going to be blown. This guy just got risen from the dead. This must be the Messiah. No, it's not. And, uh, but anyways. But what we do is we sensationalize it. You know, just tell me what I did right now. You know what that does? It makes it less sensational. It eases our heart, right? So what if they right? I don't need to be scared of that guy. What's the worst thing you can kill me? Kill me, I'll go to heaven. I'll be okay. You know, yeah. By the way, you, you, you got to be prepared for any of this to happen in case the sequence isn't exactly what you think it is. That and I'm fun. But we sensationalize and we get on TV. You don't remember who Jack Van Empey was? <coughs> no? Oh, that's good. Yes, you do. Harold Camping? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, you know, oh, the rapture's going to happen this October 15th at this time, and all of a sudden it doesn't. And everybody just, why can't you read Deuteronomy where it says if a prophet comes and gives a message and it doesn't happen, shut up. <laughs> well, it was spiritual, not physical. Yeah, just, just stop. But Jack Van Impey used to do this. And, uh, you know, had that TV show. Every time something flared up in the Middle East, well, this is connection to that, and it, you know, so people watch it and get scared. You don't worry, but wait, this didn't happen again. Oh, wait, this didn't happen again. Oh, wait, this didn't happen again. You know, you lose all credibility. Oh, by the way, you Christians don't have any credibility either. You know why? Because we sensationalize it. Jesus could come back tomorrow, and you know what? You're not saved. Well, you know what? Just get saved. And Jesus could come back tomorrow anyways. Be another thousand years. I think it's going to be 2038, by the way. Just so you know. <laughs> And then you stop and say, well, no man knows the time around. I agree with you. That's why I think it's not going to be 2038. It's pointless to even, no, it's not pointless to wonder. I think you can mathematically figure some things out. Uh, but at the same time, nobody knows the day or the hour. So then number four, what we say there, we believe, uh, we believe in the second coming. Uh, number five, by the way, with that also comes the millennium. That's going to be a fun time. Talk, you know, the Bible talks about us ruling and reigning with him. And well, you, my question, are we going to rule and reign over? And that, uh, that's another complete discussion, but the answer is right there in Matthew 24 and 25. All right. So number five, what we, well, number four, we said again, believe in the second coming. Matter of fact, we said believe in God, believe in Christ, believe in heaven, believe in the second coming. Number five, believe in the presence of Christ. Look here in verse three. There at the end, and if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So you see that there? That where I am, there ye may be also. And I understand, you already said, say, I'm not a pastor, let's talk about heaven. Talk about heaven. Well, matter of fact, Thessalonians, let's go ahead and have a verse of Thessalonians real quick. And then, uh, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I watched a video in the last couple weeks, a sermon, this guy's kind of discredit the rapture. And, uh, oh, it's not the Bible. Well, the word Bible's not in the Bible. The word Trinity's not in the Bible. You know, the rapture is something that's there. And maybe we're trying to back off it or something. And But yet, if you want to just use this verse, fine. But, you know, there's so much scripture that talks about... There's, there's so many reasons why we're not... Uh, why the rapture is going to be... Why the rapture is going to happen. And, uh, and one of the main reasons is the church isn't going to be here for the last part. And uh, so... You see that there. So we're going to be with the Lord. Shall we ever be with the Lord? 
Is this only talking about heaven? Here, yes. But looky here. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Jesus said this 2,000 years ago. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Huh. Jesus' parting words were, I'm with you. Do you ever feel like you, 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 don't, you don't receive it? Right? Where's God right now? I don't feel it. Uh, you know, you come into church, you know, I'm just not feeling it today. And uh, but there are other times when you do feel it. You're man, the whole the Holy Ghost is part of that. Is that how that works? No. It isn't at all. Here, you see here, go there, follow We teach him. We witness. We baptize. And uh, then we uh, we then after we baptize, we have um, discipleship and teaching. Do those things. And Jesus didn't say, and then you'll feel my presence. He says, hey, I am with you. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And at the end of the age, guess what? Then we're with them completely and forever. Talk to myself this line. Do we have any real reason to complain? Um, are you worried right now? What are you worried about? Is it something that you can cast your care upon like the Bible talks about? Is it something you can leave there and walk away from? Maybe not. But there, here are things that we know we can do regardless of the situation. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, the Bible never says that the truth shall make you free. Or, I'm sorry, the Bible never says that it shall make you free. Not in some versions do, I get it. But however, the Bible says the truth shall make you free. I can be in a prison cell and be made free by the truth. I might still physically be in the cell. I am physically in this life. I am physically in this body till the day of death. And you know what? I can still be free in it. Because the truth shall make us free. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. So then therefore, that means we have a choice. It's a command. Ye believe in God. We believe also in me. So we believe in God. We believe in Christ. We believe then in heaven. We believe in the second coming. And then we believe in his presence. The presence is always there. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Isn't that a wonderful promise? You know, if our kids go haywire, you know what? We still love them. They still need something. We're still there for them. And then we think God's a better. <laughs> we think we're a better parent than God. How silly, right? How silly for us to think, well, if I go out of line, you know, God's going to kick me out. There's not going to be one person in hell that can say, Jesus turned me away. It's true. Jesus loves us, died for us, and he asked, he, matter of fact, he doesn't want me to be eternal. He, he wants me to be happy. I come that they get my have life and have it more abundantly. I think that Jesus wants us to have a twinkle in our eye. I think Jesus wants us happy. I think that Jesus, but you know what? This is life, and life sometimes stinks. That's not a very encouraging message, is it? But you know what the encouraging message is? I have somebody go, go with me and I'm alone through it. Still going to feel alone sometimes? Yeah. Sometimes Jesus' presence isn't, 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 is far as we're physical. You know, isn't it enough to stop us from sometimes feeling lonely? Isn't it enough sometimes for other things? And, 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 and we get that. Life is difficult. But can you imagine going through life without God, without Jesus Christ? And people try to do it every day. But yet we couldn't even breathe the air around us if it wasn't for Him. He loves us. Father, again, we're thankful.